Jeffrey Wu, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Hey, thanks, Ben, for having me. I can't wait to geek out with you, fellow biohacker. You're doing some cool things. You got an amazing company, and we'll talk all about the biohacking stuff. Before we do, brother, how did you get involved with what you're doing? What, what is your story? What was your journey? Yeah, I have a pretty, I would say, circuitous route to getting to this position here where uh, very plugged into the human performance community and the keto community. Uh, my background is in computer science, studied computer science at Stanford. So I always had that engineering mindset going into how I think about problems and systems. And was in the startup space, uh, ran an app company that I sold to Groupon back in 2013. And I would say that my interest in Takeda was probably different from most other people's route in Takeda. I got interested in keto and metabolism through wanting to initially boost my cognitive performance. So again, based in Silicon Valley, I almost saw my friends and uh, other folks in the space like as, as intellectual athletes, right? When we talk about Olympic athletes, are very focused on physical performance. And I would say that in business, they're essentially battling on the field of ec ec economics. Um, so my initial interest into human performance was through the lens of cognition and then through cognition, it was interesting to see that some of the mo ro most robust, uh, methods to boost, uh, BDN BDNF or the growth of new neurons was through fasting. So it was through fasting and starting to do, uh, longer fasts and diving into literature there that got me interested in the physiology of ketosis because when you're doing intermittent fasting, you're, you're depleting your glycogen reserves and upregulating ketosis. So my route, go there, therefore, going to ketosis is very much on the cognition perspective, as opposed to, I think, most people get into keto from a weight loss, weight management perspective. Yeah, they do. I would say, yeah, come for the weight loss benefits, stay for the cognitive and health benefits of, of keto. So I, that's a really cool route. Same thing for me. My primary goal was not really weight loss. At the time that I got into to keto, it was just feeling better and reducing inflammation. So you started studying ketosis, you started studying fasting and how you upregulate ketones when you're not eating carbohydrates or anything at all when you're fasting. What were some of the first signs you started to notice that you actually felt better with, with ketones being produced? Yeah, well, I think I want to just be level with expectations. I think the first few times I was fasting was terrible, right? I think that people think that this is like an instant metabolic flip where it's like, oh, you go from eating a standard Western diet and you start fasting and you're like in God mode. It's like, no, it's like quite a terrible process to get more keto adapted. Um, and to, to, for me, this process was really buoyed by the fact that I had all my coworkers at HVMN wanting to do fasting with me. Um, so we just set it, ourselves up for a challenge. Just at the end of 2015, early 2016, where we kind of decided to do uh, 36 or 60-hour or, or, or fast, a two-and-a-half-day fast. And this is based on some of the research for uh, out of Walter Longo's group looking at longer fasts for longevity. Um, so we did it together. The first month was pretty terrible, right? Like going from expecting to eat three meals a day and snacks to then not eating for two and a half days was quite a shift. But then on like the third or fourth week, I just felt a lot clearer cognitively. And I just felt like there's much less distraction in terms of my work day as I didn't need to worry about constantly figuring out what my next meal was. So I think there was that subjective personal experience, but I think I was more buoyed by the fact that the literature was strong, right? Like I am pretty maybe over obsessed with the notion of placebo effects. I know it's very easy to trick or uh, be over optimistic on any new intervention. So I was almost over indexing away from that um, and not worrying too much about the subjective field, but really looking at the broader literature. Um, and then what like really got me convinced was starting to play with blood finger sticks and continuous glucose monitors and like blood draws. We could really understand my metabolism in a rigorous way. So the subjective stuff was like decent, right? Like I think with any new intervention, 
like the placebo effect of trying a new routine is going to get you jazzed and, and motivated. And I had a, a lot of that. But what would get brought me really excited was, hey, my fasted blood glucose was much lower. Uh, my ability to not have these like slow, uh, uh, these big glucose spikes and crashes after like carby meals at lunch, that was, I could tell from my continuous glucose monitor. That what was got me really, really focused and excited about the space. So you're uh, a C the CEO of the company, and you are a, an entrepreneur. You're definitely somebody who's business oriented, and, and I am myself as well. So how important is it to prioritize your health when you want to scale a company, when you want to make a big impact with your business? I think uh, I think it's ultimately the only asset that we as humans have is our health and our time. Um, but I don't want to over index on just our personal experiences here, because I think that a lot of people seem to do okay mortgaging their health for building companies, right? Like I have a lot of friends that are based in New York or San Francisco building these tech companies who are talking about working out twice a month and like not really sophisticated around their diet and they don't look that healthy, but they're building good businesses, right? So I think there's like this mortgaging of immediate health for a long-term value, but I'm not convinced that they just truly understand the, the, the full costs of that choice. And maybe this is me being overly pompous around our strategies here of like really integrating health into our business. Uh, or maybe that, you know, their right, their, their, their route is more optimal. I think that's like the beauty of, uh, human life, we get to choose whatever objective function or whatever goals or, or targets that we try to, to try to achieve. But speaking from my experience personally, talking to people that are quite successful, middle, late stage of their careers, um, everyone at some point wants to convert their business or their assets into more time and more health, right? Like if you are, have cancer when you're 50 or you're obese when you're 55 and you have $10 million, and you can't enjoy that capital that you create over time, what does that, what does that even mean, right? And I think maybe when you're in your 20s, 30s, you're relatively healthy, uh, you don't account for it that much. But my sense, speaking to folk, folks that are a little bit further in their careers, a little bit further in their business journeys, um, maximizing the value of their time gets more and more important because they just see that it's going down and down and down. So from that perspective, I've seen that you know, I think properly accounting for day-to-day -day happiness is crucial for overall what I consider success. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I love that you laid that out. It's, it's what it is. There's no immediate impact for bad dietary choices day-to-day -day until all of a sudden it's accumulated to the point where, like you said, somebody could be diagnosed with a disease or you're obese and you don't have the energy to enjoy that month vacation in Europe with your family, if you're complaining all the time, what good is all that money and freedom? If you don't have the vitality. So absolutely. And that's our priority. And we're definitely not the norm. But I just wanted to hear you express it because I, I talk a lot to entrepreneurs and I speak at conferences for entrepreneurs. And I want to get that message across that you could have it all. You don't have to sacrifice your business to grow your health. In fact, if you take care of your health, I believe your business will grow even more. What you're doing with your company, you're having your company fast. You're having your company, uh, I'm sure a lot of your, your employees are doing the ketogenic diet or they're in ketosis. And have you seen that uh, increase your, your productivity and help your company grow? Yes. So that's the second part of it. Like, not to say that there's no short-term acute effects. I think, you know, I think talking about the long-term, I think it's like a more fair, more holistic way of thinking about it. But I think there are definitely acute productivity results from what we're doing. Um, so maybe one way to think about it is just from a day-to-day -day performance level, um, I would say that you, you see a lot of people, I mean, I, maybe, maybe the way to think about it is that you want to actually make high quality decisions over time, over a set period of time. And what's the best way to do that? It's being cognitively clear. So I think when you're not constantly chasing carbs or have this carb insulin cycle,
when you're just very, very lucid and not having to take amphetamines or caffeine to get on with your day. I feel like my, uh, my, my decision making and my mood is generally much, much better. And I can sustain it for much, much longer periods of time than other people. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm doing with HVMN is that it's not just like a product company. I really think of ourselves as a culture company. I think like programs like yours, like your community with Keto Camp, I think is very much in the same overall effort. I think that our current modern ways of nutrition, our lifestyles are very much optimized for societal productivity or population level productivity. You know, capitalism works by generating productivity over the whole system but it very much is not necessarily optimizing for the happiness and productivity for the individual. Right. So I think to me, it's, I think the products and services are just one attribute into building and changing a little bit of the culture of what we as society are, are, are living in. I think an overall happier society has healthier, more lucid individuals uh, versus like the, the, the wheel of capitalism working but every single individual is not very happy or not very fulfilled and not very healthy. Right. I see that as well. And um, I, I, I will say that there's no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. And it starts with having awareness and being present. So I love that you touched upon that. Let's talk a little bit more about fasting. You, yeah. uh, I know I, I've been looking at some of your Instagram posts and I listened to a couple of uh, episodes this past week of your, on your podcast and you're a big fan of uh, uh, exercise in the fast state. You do, the, you do it very often. I, I just finished up a workout in the fastest state. What, what are some of the benefits of doing that, and, and why do you do it so often? Um, well, I think broadly speaking, I think that there's you know, more and more preference on periodization or cycling of fasting and, and feasting and different types of exercise, right? Like fasted exercise versus a fed exercise routine. So the data is quite compelling around uh, enhancing metabolic adaptation when you're exercising fasted, right? Uh, you have, essentially it's a way to add more hermetic stress to your workout. And if you are trying to get more keto adapted, try to deplete more glycogen, well, if you have a lower baseline of glycogen to deplete, then you're gonna get more keto adapted uh, by doing a fasted workout. So to me, it's not necessarily dogmatic where I'm saying like the fast workout is what everyone should be doing. It's more that it's taking the method or the strategy behind a fast and the reason why you work out to a specific goal of mine. So if I'm trying to ramp up my fat adaptation, then I'll do more faster workouts. I know a lot of the athletes we work with when they're just uh, doing their baseline aerobic training ahead of a training season, right? This is cycling or or long distance triathlons, a lot of those athletes will do fasted workouts to go from their like winter kind of like, you know, off season back into being very, very aerobically efficient. Uh, but as I build towards a peak period or want to be gaining more mass or trying to peak towards a specific event, then I will be doing more and more fed workouts because I'm looking for more performance and I want to get the maximal performance and as opposed to doing adaptation. So I think to me, the, the, the lesson is not one way is better for everything. It's what is your actual goal? And then use the right tools, which nutrition is a, a huge tool that we use and then exercise is a huge tool to use. So hopefully that, that gives a little bit of nuance of why I do a lot of faster workouts. It's more like, okay, if I really want to get into ketosis quickly, and upregulate my fat oxidation, then yeah, fasted workouts are one of the best ways to do that. Yeah, great point. It depends on your goal and, and I'm with you. I, I do it as well to get deeper stages of ketosis. And also I personally get a better workout. I feel like I get a better workout in when I don't have food in my stomach. I'm putting my fat stores at the, at the head of that metabolic bus. Um, yep. So it does make me feel better. But some days I'll go two to three hours fasted after the workout's done and continue the fast. Some days I won't. Like today I had some aminos, uh, which kind of broke the fast, but it's helping me maintain some of my, the, the muscle. So it, it, it's all about mixing it up. The body um, likes it when we force this adaptation. Uh, the cells we have get stronger. The good cells get stronger. The bad cells don't adapt. So I love what you said about sometimes you're having, you're, you're feasting and you're in a growth phase, right? And then sometimes you're doing the opposite. So perfect. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that, 
I think is interesting within the broader keto community is that I think when I first got into fasting or the ketogenic diet, it was very, very dogmatic around like less than 50 gram net carbs. You must fast 24 or 36 hours or you're not getting the benefits of autophagy or, or whatnot. And I feel like one, it's the, yes, like there's nuance, I think. I think it's like, what is the point? What is the goal, right? Because I think if you look at a lot of very, very high intensity athletes, I see them go get into ketosis with upwards of 100, 150 grams of carbohydrate. This just depends on your workout load and your actual metabolic status. So to me, it's, I think it's a good on-ramp to give people really, really simple guidelines. And I would do the same thing if I'm telling someone, okay, how do I go on keto? Well, it's like, yeah, count your carbs, eat as low carbs as possible, and maybe start extending your intermittent fasting window. But, but I think one of the main things that I hope to bring to the table, or I think like conversations like this could be helpful is that, look, at a certain point, it's not necessarily following some magic formula. Like the goal of some, you know, YouTube thought leader around some random protocol that he wants to do for his life, for his, like, like his, his goal is likely different from like your goal or our listener's goal or like my mom's goal. And I think the main things that once you understand the strategy of why people are setting up these protocols, and then once you get a good baseline, start actually applying the strategy to what works for you. Cause like your goal and your starting position is going to be different from mine, different from yours. Right on. We're such bio, we're biochemical, unique individuals, and we all have different yeah. goals, different genetics, different, different uh, factors. So right on. I love that yeah. you touched upon that. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the fasting and why, and we're exercise and fasted, right? Why are we not losing muscle? Uh, that's a big myth that I hear or a big concern I hear. I used to own a CrossFit gym here in Miami a few years ago, and it was, oh, I don't want to fast. I'm going to lose all this hard-earned muscle. So what happens in the body when we fast to preserve muscle mass? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question, right? And I think there's a couple ways that I would think about this question, which is, one, think from an evolutionary uh, anthropological perspective. Lean muscle tissue is one of the most expensive tissues to create, and it's a functional tissue. And our bodies have fat stores and glycogen stores as metabolic substrates. That is their purpose on our bodies. Like it doesn't make sense for our bodies to prioritize burning lean muscle tissue and muscle over adipose tissue. So just from like an evolutionary perspective, like the point of having some body fat is carrying a little refrigerator of food. Um, so I think like just from a, so I think just from like the baseline, like does this even make sense from an evolution perspective? I think there's like a, interesting like thought experiment there and then if you actually look into the biochemistry and physiology it's actually pretty interesting how the body preserves lean muscle tissue during a fasted state so as one fasts uh growth hormone actually kicks up so it's actually one of the uh, a, a, you know one of the more reliable ways actually to endogenously upregulate growth hormone and actually one of the interesting side effects of having ketones in your system is it's also uh uh, it, 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 it uh, retains protein. So your body ketones, adapts to ketones do you said, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's an anti-catabolic effect of ketones. It signals that uh, you, you start prioritizing fat oxidation, um, and, upper, and, and it preserves, uh, sort of like the, like the muscle breakdown pathway. So if you actually look at some of the new literature with the, our ketone ester product, you actually see increased muscle protein resynthesis rates when you have high ketones in, in, in a system. Uh, this is done through an exogenous ketone, right? This is not endogenous ketosis, but it's an interesting data point to describe the overall effects of ketosis. So I, I would say there's like two, two, two main effects. So you have upright, you have increased levels of growth hormone and growth hormone is uh, anti-catabolic or an anabolic hormone. And you have the presence of ketones that are also anti-catabolic. And these start preserving your muscle tissue. So does this mean like you just starve and then like expect never to start burning muscle tissue? It's like, well, no. Like when you exercise, you definitely do do damage. You do want to repair. And that's why I think a sensible approach is to, uh, you know, refeed properly after a workout. And you get some kind of benefits of both worlds. So, um, so again, I think... So I think from those two lenses is how I'd answer like the critic or the skeptics there. 
Um, like, I don't know, like we'd be quite fragile creatures if we didn't have something to eat for our morning breakfast and then we need to go hunt and we couldn't hunt. Like, okay, why we would not survive with species if that was the case that we're so fragile. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense evolutionary. It doesn't make sense with the current literature and what the body does to upregulate the counter-regulatory hormones. Uh, it's, it's so fascinating. And, and when you break it down the way you just broke it down, when you look at evolution, when you look at what ketones do, and we look at these growth hormone and what it does to preserve muscle, it makes absolute sense that the body is not going to store body fat for energy. And then when the chips are down, start burning down the muscle where it's not effective to do so. So uh, I love that. Great, great answer. Let's l- talk a little bit more about the esters, ketone esters. I think there's, uh, I, pr- I get questions all the time about, should I use exogenous ketones? What about this brand? And there's a time and place that I suggest it and I make sure the brand is a quality source. So teach yeah. us a little bit more about your ketone esters, who should use it, who should not use it and go, go a little bit into depth about these ketones. Esters. Yeah. I, yeah. A good question. I think so broadly speaking, I think there's like a whole cottage industry around how to best support a ketogenic diet, right? I think everyone realizes like a big, massive mega, mega, mega trend here. And I think it makes sense from just a healthcare and a, and a health and lifestyle perspective. Um, so I think the space is quite crowded and, and kind of noisy. So you have ketone esters and our ketone ester actually originated from a DARPA program uh, initially funded in the early 2000s to enhance soldier performance. And this was a step up, this was a step function improvement of uh, ketone salts. So I'd say that if you look at exogenous ketones as an overall category, there's mainly two different buckets. You have uh, ketone salts. So these are uh, basically beta hydroxybutyrate uh, bound to a mineral like a sodium, a calcium, a potassium and you deliver some level of ketones through a salt form. So what a ketone ester is, is that this is a beta hydroxybutyrate bound to a butane dial, and this butane dial molecule actually gets converted directly into beta hydroxybutyrate, first pass metabolism through your liver. So it's essentially a a really efficient way to deliver 100% of beta hydroxybutyrate, essentially a food form. So the really cool thing about what a ketone ester does is that in a normal endogenous ketogenic state, one has to do carbohydrate restriction to generate ketones. Um, you have to essentially force your body into a physiological state where there's no carbohydrate and it forces fat oxidation and it forces uh, ketogenesis. So the really kind of crazy paradigm shifting thing with exogenous ketones and particularly ketone esters is that you now actually have a way to directly eat ketones. Uh, so one of the coolest demos I like to do with a keto nester is that I'll take a flood, a, a blood finger stick, uh, show, you know, 0.1, 0.2 millimole ketones, drink a keto nester drink, and then 30 minutes test my blood uh, finger stick again and show three, four, five millimole ketones. And this is very, very consistent. Um, it's essentially like drinking like a sugar drink, like you're just delivering exactly glucose in your system, but this is like delivering exactly beta hydroxybutyrate into your system. Um, so what are the use cases? Uh, I think when we initially launched a product in, uh, early 2018, a lot of the people thought that this was like a, like a fat melter magic bullet, right? Like this is like Kim Kardashian's ketogenic diet in a drink form. And that is, uh, like quite wrong, right? So ketones actually have calories and they're actually an energy substrate. Uh, so think of this as a way to deliver a fourth macronutrient that has a very different impact on metabolism in a food form. So that's not to say there isn't metabolic benefits for health and, and weight management, but I think it's a very nuanced answer that this is going to melt fat off your body directly. So our customer base today most of our customers of the ketone ester of HVM and ketone ester are high end performance athletes. So about half the Tour de France teams this last se- last summer were our customers. Uh, a lot of the top finishers at the world championships of Ironman were our customers. A lot of uh, 
professional teams in soccer, football, basketball, our customers. So really backing some of the most forward-thinking athletes in sport. And the reason why they're using it is for enhanced endurance performance. So you get uh, overall better endurance compared to just gold center carbohydrate if you have ketone ester plus carbohydrate together as a fuel. And why we think this works is because you essentially get more possible substrate than is, than is available in normal physiology. If you think about normally in physiology, if you are in a ketogenic state, you have ketones and you're burning fat, but you have no very, very low glycogen. If you're a very, very carb loaded athlete, you have a lot of carbohydrate and a lot of glycogen, but your fat oxidation is perhaps impaired. It's not as, you know, not as easy for you to turn that switch. And that's why people hit the wall, right? When people bonk, it's people not be able to switch to fat burning when they run through their glycogen reserves. Um, so the interesting thing, thing with ketone esters is that you can have high ketones and drink and carb load as much as you want at the same time. So you have high carbs and ketones at the same time. And that's how we're seeing better endurance performance. And then on the back end, and as I was referencing a little bit earlier, talking about fasting and why that is interesting from an anti-catabolic effect is that uh, some of our... Uh, research collaborators out in Belgium published a couple papers around increased muscle protein resynthesis and increased glycogen resynthesis when supplementing and recovering with the ketone ester. So actually one of the best use cases we believe is from a recovery perspective. Um, you just show less uh, biomarkers of muscle fatigue and damage. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And so what I have a few questions based off of what you just shared. If somebody has high glucose levels because they're having carbohydrates and they take the ester, so let's say, they, let's say their blood sugar levels are uh, 115, hypothetically. 115 yeah. and they take the esters and they have 3.0. Will the body use, won't the body use the glucose before it uses the ketone? Is that, is that the goal you're going here for the athletes? That the body will burn the glucose and all of a sudden it has that backup with the ketones and you have the steady state of energy? Is that what you were referring to? Uh, a little bit. So actually, what's interesting is that ketones are burnt actually preferentially. So ketones actually go ahead of your glucose. So, so I think, well, I think the answer is actually more nuanced. It's always a blend. Like, like you're not 100% anaerobic, not 100% aerobic at any given point, especially in, in, in these, some of these exercises when you're ramping up intensity. So you're burning a blend of fuel, but especially in brain metabolism, when you're supplementing with a exogenous ketone, your brain starts, uh, and I think the kind of the rule of thumb is that each millimole of ketones in your blood translates to about 10% of your brain energy being produced by ketones versus glucose. So essentially you're, you're uh, adding a third fuel beyond fat and glucose in the mix that normally wouldn't be there. So what if somebody is producing the ketones endogenously and they yep. have high, high blood sugar levels? Because my thought on this is if I have a client and they have 130 uh, glucose, uh, which is pretty yeah. high, and yeah. they have 2.1 ketones endogenously, my thought process is the, the brain's going to use, it's not going to use those ketones as efficiently. It's not going to metabolism, metabolize those ketones as efficiently because it's going to be using the glucose first because glucose is a toxic fuel source and the body wants to get rid of that first. Um, what do you think about that? So how, how does, so that's, that's a pretty interesting like scenario, right? So how, how does the, this subject have that high blood sugar? They have right? I've, I've expect, like, okay. So this is like a metabolically deranged yeah. individual. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so this is more from a therapeutic perspective. So um, I think like really the answer is that the interesting thing with, uh, with a, when you consume an exogenous ketone with a ketone ester, we see that it actually drops blood sugar. So what we think is happening there is that it stops the release of uh, glucose from your liver. So we, it looks like it stops hepatic gluconeogenesis. So we actually see consistently 15, 30 point reduction in blood sugar acutely with a ketone ester drink. And that's been shown in published papers. And one of the interesting results coming out of University of British Columbia in Oxford was showing that a ketone ester drink before oral glucose tolerance test reduces a glycemic response. Mm. So to answer your question directly, what I would expect to see is that um, 
the body, I, I like, I, like there's no like they think it's poison or not poison. I think it's just like there's substrate that's ketones, there's substrate that's glucose, and usually, the, like in a normal f- metabolically healthy person, you don't usually have high of either. And what we see is that I would expect that they would try to they would burn both down. And usually in a in 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 a, in, in a normal situation, you burn ketones actually before glucose uh, because. You know, ketones are more aerobic and ketones usually, I think it's always a mix basically. Like, like they'll both, both get burnt down into, and, and get to a homeostatic position. So if the person has high glucose, high ketones, it'll be, you're saying it'll be a, a mix of both. So they won't feel as good as if they had optimal glucose and the same amount of ketones. Is that a, a fair statement? Let's say they had 80 uh, glucose numbers and they had 1.5 ketones they'd feel more of the effect of those ketones because their glucose is optimal. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's like subjectivity and sensitivity to, towards how people feel on, on high or low blood sugar. Um, I, I think what, what I'll say there is that 80 milligram deciliter sugar and 1.5 millimole ketones is much more of a normal looking like homeostatic equilibrium than 130 milligram deciliter <laughs> Uh, sugar and, and 2.1 uh, BHB. But I think that could look okay if you are maximally fueled to try to win an Olympic gold medal, right? Like I think that's like the interesting thing with looking at it from a disease perspective versus a performance perspective. And I think one of the interesting things is that uh, a lot of athletes, when they're trying to do maximal performances, like their metabolic markers like don't look like they're like healthy. Right. So like if you're trying to max up performance and having availability of max sugar and max ketones can be beneficial, but in a normal state, when you're not trained to win an Olympic gold medal, that's probably, that's like a bad state to be in. Totally. Got it. I'm clear on that. I love the conversation. It's a lot of fun. Okay. okay. I want, I want, we have a few, we have about 10 minutes left, 12 minutes left. I want to get into some of your, uh, your personal achievements and some of your biohacking goals. So let's talk about that. Uh, yeah. you, com- you completed a seven day water fast a couple years ago. And, uh, how was that experience? It was one of the more spiritual things I've ever done. Um, I think it really gave me a personal intuitive grasp on what it's like to actually be hungry. I think in modern society, we never truly know what like lack of hunger is. I mean, again, this is a very first world problem, right? Like there's definitely parts of the world where there's famines and definitely not belittling that situation. But in America, right, 67% of people are overweight, obese and pre-diabetes, diabetes are skyrocketing. I think that this is the calamity that's facing us in America. Um, so I think just from that personal level, I, having done, going from thinking that it was, that I would, that's like literally not, that's not possible to then doing it. Uh, gave me some sense of discipline and accomplishment around, okay, like we can really push our bodies, you know, 10 times harder than what we like initially could think. And then two, just seeing my, my retention of lean muscle tissue after doing some DEXA scans before and after seven day fast gave me additional N equals one data around how I wasn't just burning through all my lean muscle tissue. Obviously I lost weight, right? I burnt, like I, I, I dropped, overall pounds but after uh like a couple weeks of refeeding and training like my lean muscle tissue actually went up and my body fat percentage went down so it was like pretty cool to see that with a proper fast and the refeeding cycle like i was getting improved body composition not just like losing all the gains right um and uh so yeah i think i think just from like a spiritual understanding one self level that's a very uh impactful uh, thing, right? Like I would compare it to like someone running their first marathon or someone like, you know, graduating from, you know, something hard, right? It's like, okay, I was able to put the challenge on the, on the table and, and do it. And I think it wasn't easy for me. Uh, I, I tried a couple times, like quit at day three, day four. Uh, I mean, it's just hard, right? Like, uh, you, you get, you get kind of hungry. I think hunger kind of peaks at like day two, day three, mm-hmm. but then the hunger kind of attenuates out, you know, I was hitting, 
at the end of seven days, like 5.4 millimole ketones. So I think after like breaking through two and a half, three millimole ketones, the hunger really just attenuates. And I felt like very, very lucid, very, very clear. Um, didn't need as much sleep. Uh, I was working out through the, through the, through the fast. Um, every day. Yeah. So I do like, it was hard for me to do, uh, cardio, but I was like lifting and I was basically trying to like continue to stimulate, uh, the big muscle groups to keep the growth hormone up and basically make sure to really retain uh, lean muscle tissue there. Interesting. Did you, what was your, what were your ketone and glucose readings towards the end of the fast before you broke it? Uh, at the end, I was down to around 64 milligrams per deciliter sugar and 5.4 millimoles BHB. Yeah, so, um, that, that's, uh, so 60, um, 64 and 5. Point what? 5.4. So you achieved that uh, maximum autophagy. You were well into that maximum autophagy that Dr. Thomas Seafried talks about. Um, I hope so. I mean, seven day not eating anything. I mean, it's a pretty long fast. Yeah, yeah, right on. I love that. I, I, I this year I have a group of uh, thirty people that I that I did. Um, every hey, sorry about that. No, all good. So, so this year every every uh, every three months I had a group of about twenty five to thirty people that I took and I guided them a seven week program called Beyond Fasting that I guided them from being a sugar burner to on week six to completing a five day water fast or a variation of it. Um, yeah. And I, I monitor their glucose and the ketones, make sure it's going in the right direction. And a lot of the benefits that you shared is exactly what happened with the, with the, uh, with the members and for myself as well. I, was, I had my GABA being released. I was very much like present and I wasn't talking as much. I remember my girlfriend was telling me like, why aren't you talking to me? I was just very present, introverted to myself, and it was very a spiritual experience, so I could relate yeah. to what you shared. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your upcoming biohacking goals. You, um, you want to now do a seven-day fast with the ketone esters. What do you expect to see, and, and why is that a goal of yours? Uh, I think it's like an interesting, uh, interesting N equals one data point, right? Because I think... Uh, one of the theses behind the ketone ester space is that I think that if we really do our jobs right, ketone esters or just exogenous ketones themselves will be thought of as a fourth macronutrient. Meaning that like, just like you have different types of fats, different types of carbohydrate, different types of protein, people will have different types of ketones that are just part of their diet. Um, so I think just showing that one can do a extended diet of just ketones and see hopefully benefits there would be an interesting N equals one experiment that people haven't done before. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear about it as well. So I hope, I know you probably will talk about it on your podcast. So uh, keep, keep us updated on that. Okay, yeah. what are some of, uh, a couple other, two other of your favorite biohacks that you like to incorporate? Um... I mean, I think like, I think to me, like biohacking is like a funny term because I think people tend to think of it as like unrigorous or kind of like stunty. And I think to me, that's like a very diminutive way to think about what we're doing, right? I think it sounds like you're very quantitative and scientific driven on why these things are interesting, right? So like when people write about biohackers eating a ketogenic diet and then thinking that's kind of silly, it's like, no, well, this is this really good body of evidence and data behind why people are doing this. Um, so I guess like things I consider like biohackery, I think just like should be normal. Like, like I think going back to the culture question, like these things should just be normal best practices, not like biohacks. Mm -hmm. um, I think like a hot sauna, I think the data behind Hot saunas after workouts are really good. Uh, the data behind elevation of heat shock protein and growth hormone is interesting. And then some pretty early, like small amount of data upregulating testosterone post, uh, post like, you know, extended hot sauna is pretty interesting. So I like doing that um, after like my heavy workouts. Um, I've had just good conversations with folks in the military and athletes who like got really good gains. Um, 
uh, after incorporating like hot sauna sessions after like their, their exercise. So it's kind of like this good data and like good conversations with like world-class performers to like how, how have long? that be a, How long do you do As long that? as possible. I try to be in there for like 15 minutes, but really like I think the data gets really compelling like for like 30 minutes. So I think, I think, the, I think the subjective rule of thumb for me is like just be in there as long as possible until you feel like you really just you can't stand it. I think mainly for me, it's like I, I wish I could like spend 17 hours at the gym every single day, but like, you know, we, we got like actual real life to do and you got to like run to a meeting or actually do go to, go to the office. So I can't be there typically as long as I want. Um, but I try to get at least, you know, a good sweat on where I feel my heart rate elevate, right? It's kind of essentially like a free cardio workout at the end of a heavy session already. Uh, so I think, I think I, that's definitely like a core staple. Um, and then on the metric side, I think just from an engineer of computer science background, you should get a sense of the quantitative numerics behind how your body is evolving or, or changing towards these interventions. Like from an engineer's perspective, you can't measure it, you can't optimize for it. So I think that's why I like continuous glucose monitors. I like doing regular uh, blood panel checks to actually, again, benchmark if what I'm doing actually is working, right? Again, like you gotta be, I think, allergic to self-delusion, right? Like one can trick themselves. And like, that's not our goal here. Like we don't, like, I wouldn't do any of this stuff if I was just tricking myself on this. Like I actually just wanna do stuff that actually works. And I think that's because that's what ultimately will have long-term value. And let's check that against data. And the way to do that is to measure stuff, whether that's blood finger sticks, continuous glucose monitor, or doing like quarterly blood panels. Uh, I think I would encourage that as like a biohack or just something from a preventative medicine or just like a self gut check to see what you're doing is actually working for yourself. Yeah, it's great advice. I love that. I do a lot of those uh, blood panels as well. Um, it's, it's important to look at that because yeah, we want to make sure we feel good, we look good, and also we, we verify it with the data. And that's what you just explained, getting those, those lab works done. What are some of your favorite uh, markers to look at to, uh, when you do your quarterly reports? Yeah, so I think the big ones for me is like, you got to get your lipids, right? Just understanding LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Right? I think within the keto community, there's an interesting debate around whether LDL it's, you know, a lot of people on a key drink that will see elevated LDL. And I think there's an interesting debate whether that is causative of cardiovascular risk. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that's been a topic that you've covered and people, there's been a lot of good content around that. So we'll open up can of worms at this point, but I think getting an understanding of your lipid panel, but I, I would expect that you want to see relatively high HDL and relatively low triglycerides. I think that is uncontroversial. Um, and I like looking at uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a marker for inflammation. Um, I see very, very low inflammation when I'm on like carnivore ketogenic diet. I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, fasted insulin, fasted glucose. Um, like the blood sugar is easy on the measure, but what I think is really underlying is that you want a good low insulin baseline, right? Insulin is essentially like the mother hormone that controls your glucose response. So it's easier to measure glucose. You have a finger stick, but insulin is the one that you want to make sure you have good insulin sensitivity or low insulin resistance. Awesome. I love it. So uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Where can my audience learn more about the work that you're doing? Yeah. So our company, HVMN, uh, we produce uh, the, you know, the original ketone ester that came from the DARPA program. So you can find us at hvmn.com or on all the social handles. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel and it would be maybe fun to do a swap a and have you come on our program. Um, yeah. So you can find us on hvmn. And then I'm also pretty active on my personal channels as well. So at G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-W-O-O on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Yeah. We'll put all of those links in the notes of it's going to be a YouTube video. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll get those links down below, go check it out on the podcast. It'll be in the notes of the podcast. Um, I would love to come on your show. I've been, I've been watching your work for quite some time. I saw an interview you did, I think was with Dr. Jason Fung a few years ago, and that's when I started yeah. to get into your work. So I want to acknowledge you, Jeffrey, for the work that you're doing, your company, you're getting the research and getting it to the masses. 
And that's how we change the world because there's so many people. You said the stats, 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. We have a sick nation we live in. And the work that you're doing really helps put a dent in that. And I want to thank you for this conversation. It was very, very intriguing to me. I learned a lot. And uh, I really appreciate what you're doing. And keep fighting that good fight, brother. And I support you. Hey, much appreciated, Ben. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeffrey.